Welcome to Hunters and Unicorns, the sales leader's playbook. Today, our guest is none other than Anthony Palladino. Anthony went from selling knives to owning three quarters of a billion dollar revenue number at Splunk. We discover a very unique leadership style that took him to the top of his game. This is Anthony's playbook. In the special edition series, The 33 CXOs, we investigate one of the greatest success stories in the history of software sales. 33 CXOs learnt the playbook from one man, John McMahon, a legacy which stretches back to the late 90s at a company called PTC. They were later reunited at Blade Logic, which was acquired by BMC. What happened next was truly remarkable. These CXOs went on to become the most prolific sales leaders in the software industry. They've raised over 22 billion in VC funding. They contribute to 4% of software turnover globally, 26 unicorns, eight decacorns, and the companies they drive have a combined valuation of 230 billion. At Hunters and Unicorn, we're revealing their playbook. I'm Simon Kutis, and I'm joined by my co-host, Oli Kune. And we are absolutely delighted to welcome Anthony Palladino. Anthony, welcome. Hey guys. Great welcome, Anthony. Thanks, Ali. Thank you, Simon. Appreciate, appreciate you having me here. So, um, Anthony, you, you're obviously having a remarkable career, CRO at CloudBees, but the story really begins with you selling knives, going on to becoming <laughs> a sales leader at BMC via Blade Logic. How does that happen? Uh, a lot of good luck, I guess, maybe, maybe, but uh, no, I think, uh, I think that happens through, um, through some good lessons and uh, some hard work, some hard learned lessons along the way, for sure, but definitely for some hard work. So did, did you always know you were going to be in software sales? You know, I, uh, no, absolutely not. I knew I was going to be in business of some sort and early in my career, I had a sales experience and had a pretty big failure and thought, wow, that didn't feel good. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll go try and do something else. But, um, but I found my way back into, uh, into sales. I was a born, born salesperson, I think, before I even knew what it was. Fantastic. So um, just to give you know, some insight. So um, Number of opportunity, number of roles, um, as, as you said, leading up from selling knives, then entering into the software space. Um, finally, I think really the start and the main start uh, from previous conversations was Mercury Interactive, which was then a software company acquired by HP. Right. Um, and then from HP, Blade Logic. So, why Blade Logic? Why did they hire you? Maybe you can give us a bit of an insight into that. Yeah, I think with, with Blade Logic was an interesting one. I actually um, was, uh, I had an opportunity to go there, but I was actually pursuing another opportunity. And, uh, and at the time I had an offer for Blade and, uh, and this other opportunity hadn't concluded its diligence process. So I remember taking a trip I went to, I think it was Seattle. And I went out with about 10 questions and I talked with, with, uh, with Blade and said, hey, before I accept, I really need to play this other thing through because it was going to kind of be a manager role and a uh, manager player coach role. And it was it was uh, more of a bigger title. And, you know, I said, I, I'm interested in this. It was a different type of technology on the more of the business application. <clears throat> so I went out with about 10 questions. And do you know how many questions I came home with? Go on probably about 15 or 20. So <laughs> you know, that's not, that's not a good sign. So I actually went back to, uh, to blade and I said, okay. And they said, okay, we'll hold the job for you. And they said, uh, and so I came back and said, okay, let's go. And, uh, you know, when I was going there, I knew, and at the time I was joining with, uh, Carlos Della Torre. I think you guys are uh, in touch with Carlos. Who's a, who's a great, great guy. Um, but, uh, I knew that, going in that organization, I was going to learn a lot. I knew that I was going to get better. And I knew that the chance of me being successful was very, very high, uh, given that they had kind of an approach and a system in a way that felt kind of natural. And it felt ways that natural things that I was doing, but uh, 
but I hadn't really had as much of a, a system or an operational rhythm necessarily around it. So I had a very high degree of confidence that with, uh, with, that, with that leadership, I was going to have an opportunity to do really well. And I had done well before, but um, that was one where I thought it was going to be exceptional. Sure. And so, so why is it, do you think that Blade Logic hired you? What was it about yourself that, you know, attracted you, attracted them to you to the business? Yeah, I think at the time uh, they were they were uh, looking for people who had some pretty good raw intelligence. They were at a point in their career where they had had some success, uh, but uh, you know they still had probably a lot more success to have. Um, they uh, were looking for people who were competitive and had kind of uh, an athletic background or or some type of competitive team sport background, you know, um, and and um, and uh, were really uh, just at the point where they were super committed to learning and super committed to, uh, to, to being able to execute and we're, we're, we're going to be able to commit to the work. So I think, um, you know, and actually the funny thing was when I first talked with them, I remember I had, uh, I, 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 uh, in part of the interview process, I, I probably almost didn't get the job. I remember speaking with, uh, with Carlos and he asked me, what are the things you're working on? And I said, well, I think I'm pretty good. And, a little bit so I'm working on a little bit of everything but I think I'm pretty good at prospecting and closing and engaging and things like that so he goes to me in the meeting he goes well you failed the humility test <laughs> I wasn't trying to not be humble I really wasn't um, I was trying to be like I think I'm okay in all these things but uh and but he had a great point it was a really really great point um and it made a lot of sense we had a good laugh about it but uh, his point was not that what you're good at but just being committed to learning and committed to uh to uh understanding where you need to do better and where you need to go and just having a plan around that so it wasn't necessarily about me being not humble or him saying he would be uh super overly humble it was just about being aware right so it was a great it was a it was a fun one actually so hopefully he hears this and has a laugh if he remembers that yeah and so you know for, for me as i said you know we, we we've heard this name has come up an awful lot it was a very big influential person at blade logic and in the industry in general but john mcmahon you know did he have much influence on you was you know how influential was he as, a, as an individual for you yeah um you know i'm i met john in the interview process and then i was part of his leadership team for a number of years uh so you know i was around uh around John quite a bit, um, you know, in, in QBRs and leadership trainings and all types of things. He was at my new hire training, giving an overview to of the company and a couple different things there and talking about some of the ways that they sell. So, uh, so yeah, it was great exposure to John. John had had and has a really significant presence. Um, and, uh, and he has a, 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 a lot of unique ways about him. So, and he's, he's learned a lot and there are a lot of people who have learned a lot from him. Uh, for sure. So I think some people um, try to be John and uh, you, you, you can't, I don't want people to try to be me either. Uh, and, uh, but uh, you, you, there are an, an immense number of things to learn from, uh, from John for sure. For sure. And, and I think that leads quite nicely on to obviously, you know, some John play, you know, blade logic, uh, obviously uh, quite influenced around medic um, and structured sales playbooks. Was this your first exposure to medic and a structured sales playbook? Uh, first exposure to medic, yes, but not first, uh, first exposure to a structured sales playbook. I was, that was probably one of the things that was made me a, a natural fit when going there too, was I was very much process oriented um, and exit criteria focused and, you know, um, thinking in terms of, of coaches and champions. Um, and uh, I didn't have as firm of a definition of it, but I think I was practicing a lot of things that, uh, that were in Medic before I actually knew Medic as, a, as an approach. Right, okay. You mentioned that you had some kind of pre preconceptions when you were going through the interview process, you kind of knew that was a place where you could become better. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, at the time with uh, Blay Logic, there was a lot of the folks from Blay Logic, you know, in particular John and a number of the, the the people there were from PTC, and PTC had, uh, and I was never at PTC, but PTC had a reputation 
you know, of a lot of things people could learn, but also being, you know, pretty intensive in environment. So, uh, and I think there probably were a number of folks over the years who may have gone there and, um, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, who did amazingly well, but then there were probably some folks who, you know, exited at some point too, right. Uh, for whatever reason. So, um, so that, there was a bit of a, uh, a bit of a, a bit of a, a reputation around it. And, uh, it was just something I, I kind of, I heard, I'd heard about, and I talked a little bit about it throughout the process. And then, um, then, uh, became pretty, um, um, you know, pretty, it was, there was nothing that was, uh, bad about it. It was just a matter of awareness. Right. And it was, it was a very clear set of expectations and how to operate that yielded, uh, some pretty good success. So. Do you think your competitive nature really gave you an advantage to be able to thrive in that type of environment? Because clearly that kind of environment probably isn't for everyone, mm. but there are some very, very specific kind of sets of attributes more than yeah. skills, which will enable you to be successful. Do you think yeah. you kind of epitomized that? Uh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, part of my competitive nature too is not, I don't, I don't want to win and have someone else lose, right? That's, that's, and then we can talk more about culture I set up, but there's, uh, we win as a team. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's something that uh, is super important to me. And that the competitiveness was super, uh, a really strong element of the DNA and approach at Play Logic for sure. But my competitiveness is more with me than it is with myself than it is with, um, with necessarily I win, you lose, right? That the I win and you lose culture. It's just bad. It creates a lot of, you, you can't scale that way and you create a culture of haves and have nots and you can't drive consistent productivity. You can't drive the type of um, ongoing uh, growth that you want by having an I win, you lose approach. So you have to create an environment that where competitiveness is within you, right? You want to compete against each other and you want to get accolades, but you want to get accolades together and maybe someone will have the most accolades and do the best but you don't want others to, to fail you never want that so but for me you know one of the things that motivates me is i'm, I'm not a huge fan of being told what to do um so <laughs> as most people probably aren't but i'm i may be more aware of it um because yeah. uh, i've probably been told except when it comes to my wife she's the boss for sure <laughs> she's the boss they're the boss in all our lives so <laughs> I can no, second that. You no, know, Simon, I'm just telling you that in case you weren't aware of it. <laughs> oh, no, in Simon's <laughs> life, it's definitely that gateway okay, for Simon that's as well. That's fine. <laughs> so, but, um, but, uh, but I think for me, the competitiveness is that I'd rather be three or four steps ahead of what everybody else is doing so that I don't need to be told what to do. And that competitiveness, I think, uh, in any type of leadership role, and even you know, as an individual contributor, it puts you in a great spot. But you need to balance it too with, with, uh, with humility, which is I think something I was going to talk about a little bit too, because you can't be, um, you're not always going to be right, and you know, it's always going to be someone who's multiple steps ahead of you. So, it's interesting the point that you just made, which is you don't really like to be kind of micromanaged or kind of to do, but. There is this misconception in the medic environment, they are going to be facing a highly KPI, very, very micromanaged environment. What's your experience of that? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> and by the way, so um, my environments are not, med I wouldn't classify my environments as medic environments. So just, we can come back to that. And mm. not, there's, but it's, there are a lot of things that are common. My environments are champion based environments. So it's a little bit of a different, a uh, different, little different there, but a lot of the elements are the same. Um, and I have other things that we do around that, but especially when you deal with more sophisticated sales and selling in a broader scale, you need to adjust a couple different things. And the way you go to market is not just medic based. So, um, uh, but I think in, in terms of look at whether it's, whether you have a set of, uh, you need to have a set of operational metrics. You need to have a cadence. The important thing as a business and as a leadership team is establishing what they are and establishing clear communication on the expectations around them. And then you have people who are, if you create, I'm, I'm going to digress a little bit, but this is a really important topic, I think, for me, because it's related to culture you create. You don't want people to work hard because they have to fulfill these reports. They have to do these statistics because Simon or Ali or Paladino is just going to be on their ass if they don't. 
That's micromanagement. That's saying you have to do all these things for me. That's bullshit. People don't get excited about that and people don't really uh, perform at their best when they're in that environment. What you have to create is a culture of ownership. A culture of ownership is where people are committed for the outcome that they're trying to drive for reasons that are very personal and important to their lives, for what they're trying to do for their family, for what they're trying to do for themselves. And they're committed to the business goals, the professional development that they have. So you've got their personal development and they've got the professional development directly linked. And the company is the vehicle for them to get there. When you create that type of ownership, the ownership of the outcome that people are doing, people will own the metrics that they're driving, not for you and not for the leadership and not for the rest of the company, but because they're committed to their success and they know that that's what forces them to get there. So I'll give you an example of this. So when we were um, in, we had a weekly activity report that we used to do at Blade Logic. Oh, I'm sorry, at Splunk. And I'm shifting a little bit of gears here in terms of times. Because this wasn't something necessarily that we did at Blade Logic. This was something that I created at Splunk. But we had a weekly activity report, and the metrics were, were very similar. So five to six face-to-face -face meetings, certain amount of new opportunities created, certain amount of opportunities progressed, what you're planning on doing next week, meeting set up. So those metrics are kind of the same. But reps would fill out the report, and they had to send the report to their leadership, right? And the reps who were super committed, and the leader had established a great culture of ownership and a great ability for that person to be him or herself and to be the best version of them. They would send a report and say, hey, I had a great week. Here's what happened. Here's what's going on. Or, hey, I had a bad week. I'm going to tell you, this really sucked. I'm so disappointed in myself on it. And I tried a couple things. I didn't do it. I got defocused. I had this happen. I had that happen. But I'm looking forward to getting our one-on-one -on -one because I got a couple of ideas that I want to run by you. But the best reps would do one of those two things. Either, hey, here's the story around it. It was pretty cool. I'm excited. Or I didn't have a great week. However, I want to, I'm excited to, I'm going to go make that different next week, right? The reps who were fully committed to that, that, that would take that ownership. The ones who weren't would just send the report with no comments, right? And with no, or, and no comments and, or maybe and you would ask them about the report and they would have very little to say to say about it and if they would have very little to say about it usually because it probably wasn't that great but instead of being in a situation in which they were looking at that report is just a mirror and that mirror is only for you your job as a leader is to help those people understand what's coming back in that mirror right that's the focus not making them force look in the mirror themselves and just push it in there you're giving them you're sitting on the same side and you're looking at it together and you're helping them to drive it but that's what metrics give you. That's what operational cadence gives you. It's not a matter of micromanagement. It's a matter of creating a leadership approach where your people are so committed and so great to have so much ownership that those, those metrics that you're driving as business are not for the leadership team. They're not for the, for, the, for the board. The metrics are for them as people and them as individual contributors. And as a leader, there's a, that's where people use the word micromanagement versus we've got a great operating rhythm. It might right. be the same set of things, but it's the application of it. And it's not only the application of it, it's the environment that the leader creates, i.e. the relationship that the leader creates, the culture that the leader creates, that affects the um, interpretation of those things. So that's where micromanagement can go sideways if you think, I'm your manager and you must do these things, versus I'm your leader and I'm here to help you unlock the, the ability and growth that you have as an individual. And the metrics are just how we're doing. Like that's going to tell us how we adjust, you know? So, and obviously those metrics go up on, on you know, higher level and they're, they're board level things that I would discuss, but because they're all nested, you know, but, um, but that's the approach. So hopefully that gives you some color. Go ahead, Ali and Simon. And digress a little bit. Uh, no, I was just, uh, yeah. just going to say that appreciation, you know, exactly what you're talking about, really being in control of where you are, understanding, you know, where you stand. Do you think that was one of the skills that helped you transition from an IC to go into management? Do you think that's one of those essential stepping stones which enables you to take that next step in your career? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. Yes. I think that enabled me to step, take that stepping stone in my career. Um, but um, there were a bunch of other things that enabled me to go from an individual contributor to a first line to, you know, um, a chief officer so 
please do tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was the next part of the question, so it was my next question anyway. Uh, this, what's the specific question, Ali, so I can stay focused? <laughs> so it was obviously the transition, right? So we've transitioned and we've spoken about going from Blade Logic um, as an individual contributor into BMC. BMC then moving up as a regional director, managing a small team. You've yeah. obviously spoken a bit about that transition. Right. Um, and then you've obviously then gone on to mention and spoken about then your transition into Splunk, where you actually took on and developed your own processes. Yeah. And it's then from developing your own processes, which have then led on to obviously championing yourself into a, a vice president role looking after the East Coast for Splunk, right? Um, and from there, it grows even further to the point of looking after three quarters of the billion dollar revenue that was generated across the Americas or total revenue, which is just outstanding. But how do you then make it's that third transition? Thirds, by the way. So two thirds. Thanks, thanks two thirds. It was about two sorry, thirds. Two thirds, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So how do you make that then second transition? And, yeah. and, and what was it that helped you? Yeah. I think one of the, one of the, so I have a, a, a bunch of things I wanted to share with you on it, but mm. fortunately, um, I, I worked, I, when I went to Splunk, I was reporting into a, a guy named Vishal Rao. Um, and Vishal was not at Blade Logic, he was at BMC, and he continues to be a, a great friend of mine, and, and he's a really strong leader. But I went in, Vishal was taking over America, so I was taking over most of the east, or the northeast part of the, of the U.S. Um, and uh, when I first went there. But uh, Vishal and I had a great kind of relationship and dialogue, but he kind of created an environment for me where I could um, become uh, the best leader, you know? So now, and I can probably talk more about that around creating an environment for your people to grow. So he kind of gave that to me. Um, so, uh, which, which, which I kind of filled up in a big way, you know? Um, but one of the things, a couple of things when I went to Splunk, I think early on that, um, that put us, put me as a leader on a good course and put the business on a good course. Um, you know, when I first went there, I put half of my team on a performance plan in the first, uh, first 30 or 40 days. And it wow. wasn't because I was there to clean out. It wasn't because I didn't like the people. It wasn't because they were bad folks, contrary to the contrary on all those things. But I was able to identify that there were patterns of behavior that they were they were driving good activity, but not driving good results. So, you know, this much business and forecasting this much and closing this much, this same, you know, that pattern was existing. So there were three people and I put them on three different, th for three different types of plans. And the plans were, were not, um, you're, you're doing a bad job plans and you need to get better. The plans were, here are the things that you're doing that are not working out the best way that they should, right? And, uh, and of the three people I put on plan, the first person became the top rep in the quarter, uh, for the quarter, and we took him off of plan. Uh, and the second two, uh, one of the persons was a great person, but just and actually hit the metrics in the plan, but just probably wasn't the best fit. And longer term, we kind of exited. Uh, and the last person, I om it was the one time I've almost gotten my butt kicked professionally. Like this person was so insulted and so mad at me because the person had been super successful in the career previously and had always done really well, was a top performer in the, in the entire region and and uh, in previous companies and uh, super experienced and uh, was so insulted, so insulted. Like if I had done it, if we did it over the phone, if I had done it in person, I might've gotten punched. So <laughs> I could take a couple punches. So it, 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 it might've, it was, it was close to that. So um, anyhow, uh, long story short, we took that, that person started doing really, really well. But the, the issue in the plan itself was probably three pages. And, um, and there were like seven things that the person was, was kind of missing on, right? Um, they were really active, but they were active and doing POCs that weren't qualified. They were talking about pricing, but didn't have champion. They were um, spending a lot of time and getting things going, but then not fully seeing them through. So we're, like, and I, I gave, I think there were about seven examples of all those things. Literally, it was a three-page thing. I personally wrote it. And uh, long story short, the person, we took the person off a plan. I fortunately did not suffer any injuries. And, uh, but that person uh, wound up being one of the top reps in the Americas um, subsequently. 
uh, in, in following years and continue to have a great, uh, a great track record there and uh, is a, still a good, a good friend to this day. Um, and there's, there's a lot in that, right? I think the, in terms of one of the, some of the things we're able to do at Splunk uh, early on, or I was able to do there was I established with these people uh, that I wasn't there to um, be difficult or be a jerk or, or um, just kind of have control. I was there to help us be successful. And I established that in a very, very quick way. And I had some people on that team who were, didn't know, not, most of those people didn't know me at all. And um, I had to establish really strong credibility really quickly because one of the things for me as a leader that you need to lead from is a position of credibility and respect. And that credibility is established through action with individual people. And everybody's different. Um, everyone's different. You need to figure out where they are and try to establish that. But that needs to come from a sincere place because again, back to the message I was sharing earlier, if you can establish that credibility, then you're sitting next to the person like this and your goal is out here. You're not sitting across the table from them and in an adversarial way. You're sitting there together and they are opening up to you and they can commit to you and they know that your intentions are sincere and your intentions are designed to help them become the best person that they can be. And when you establish that quickly as a leader, that's what I mean from leading from a position of credibility and respect, then there's nothing you can't say as long as you do it so with respect. You can put people on a plan, not because you want them to leave, but because you need to drive some structural change that's going to affect their business. And that, but I was able to establish that really, really quickly. So, um, and the result for, you know, my first six months there was I did a year's worth of business in six months. And you know, and I quickly moved into in, in scope and, and role uh, because of that. And the team, you know, continued, had some, had some great results as early. But that was one of the first things like that, um, that I did, you know, bad issues is an expression I think probably a lot of people might use, but bad news doesn't get better with time. But bad behavior or kind of misset, um, misset expectations or a bad hire, and a bad hire is not the person's fault. That's the the team's fault. Those things don't change over time. You know, you, you have to kind of either address them and, and help people get on a good path. Because when people are doing well, they feel good about themselves. When they're not doing well, it's tough to be them, especially if they care a lot. And our job as a leadership team is make sure they care. And then you're just focusing on not making them care. You're focusing on helping them to kick butt and have some fun, you know, and do the best thing they can for themselves. So anyhow, let me pause for a second. But, um, and I can give you some more stuff that we did at Splunk, but that was a uh, that was one of the things that was really quick, and I think I was able to establish a lot of credibility um, for myself then, and also. Um, with so, do you do you think the the Blade Logic BMC um, leadership team and mentorship and that what you learned in those two roles then gave you an ability to take a step back? look at some of those skills, look at some of the processes that were put in place, put your own spin on it. And that's what then led you on to yeah. you know, continue to develop the ideas that were given to you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's very, very, uh, very safe to say, you know, you have a leadership foundation and uh, a fundamental framework <clears throat> and set of um, set of uh, practices and approaches and, and then this is the thing I think where, where you can, you have to be the best version of yourself, not the best version of what someone else is. So I know that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I know where I'm going to be my best and I know where my best impact is going to come for my people. You know, uh, I'm not a yeller. I'm not a screamer and I'm never going to be that. Um, I'm pretty intense, but being able to learn what a good operating principles, what good operating principles are and a good operating rhythm, Ollie. Um, yeah. You know, some of that structure and exposure I had at BMC and Blade, but then being able to convert that into my style to make me the best leader and my own rhythm and then adjusting that accordingly is, um, has been made me, uh, I think what, what's helped a lot, you know, but it was definitely for, for sure your point on establishing kind of a strong kind of fundamental approach. Um, and, and a framework was, was definitely something to learn there. And also a culture, also an idea of consistent learning. That was one of the points I was going to make too. Yeah. Like, you know, we were always training and sometimes training is not learning something new as much as it's 
learning what you relearning, continuing to practice what you know, you know. Was that self taught or was that were there people that were proactively helping you acquire these managerial skills which you obviously harnessed? Which which skills, Simon? In in terms of the skills that you're talking about, really being able to identify and um you know, really get on side with your sales reps. These are obviously managerial skills. Are those taught or are those learnt? Are they that, practiced? Are they that concept of cult creating culture and ownership that I described to you, that's not that wasn't taught to me. That's me. That's my version of that. Um, I think what what you're you're taught is here's how to here's what the framework is, here are the operational rhythm, here are the metrics, and here's maybe a cadence to make sure that those things are being achieved. But the interpret the uh, interpretation and then the application of them and the way that you apply them was it was it was a little bit implicitly taught, but, but it's something that becomes explicitly part of my operating rhythm. Yeah. Because for me. I don't hire people who are like me necessarily, thank God, because we, we, that wouldn't be good. Um, <laughs> yeah, too many bald people all over the place. So, um, but uh, I, I look to hire really good DNA and then people who, because they're going to change the DNA of the business, but you need that diversity. You need to hire people who come from different backgrounds. You need to hire people with different, uh, different skill sets, but that's what makes it so much fun because then you can scale and every time you grow your, you're expanding the DNA of the business. And I can give some examples of people doing the best version of what they do, not the version of what you want them to do. And there's a fine line between still having a framework to say, here's what a champion is, or here's what our process is, but the, what the interpersonal magic that you have in communicating in the way you drive that with your, in your customer dialogues and have a great brand experience. Like that is magic that exists within people and you need to allow for that level of diversity in doing that. It's so interesting. Um, as I said, I think, you know, it's interesting looking at the two. What was it that made you change from medic to champion as a, as a, as a process in itself then? Is that, was there a reason? Cause or was yeah, there... it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, uh, I wasn't, um, uh, abandoning um medic so to speak uh and, and i think it's still you know it's it's definitely an element of it but uh, of what we do but the part of what happened at splunk early on was one of the things i identified is that we didn't have a consistent focus on a champion and what a champion would be because um and i needed to establish that because a lot of the business we had good activity but deals that were slipping or moving away right i i, I identified this early on and then my first QBR I had uh, actually spent after the time I spent with the team I put together the first workshop on champions and it was identifying building testing coaches and champions and I did it at my first QBR which then became something we did globally and or, you know across the regions and then I taught we taught I taught people how to teach it nationally and um and I brought it with me and morphed that for multiple years um but um and, and we did it not just in, in various different type of forms in the workshop. Um, so that was really the focus because that was a single thing that was uh, at Splunk that wasn't, uh, that was missing. And that was causing a lot of um, missed opportunities or not closure opportunities. We were capturing metrics. They knew what the pains were. Uh, they could knew what, they knew what some of the competitors were. They had a partner in there. Um, they, they didn't necessarily have a good understanding of an economic buyer um, decision process and decision criteria were a little bit um, sometimes uh, defined sometimes not but the biggest most paramount thing was a champion because if you have a champion then all those things become a subset of it so um, that was the dna that i focused on building at um, at uh, at splunk early on and, uh, and that was really became the difference because then it was, you know, we, do we have a champion and do we know and how exactly and what have we done and who are multiple champions? And then the way we expand that business and started to create an enterprise adoption agreement structure, nothing to do with play logic, nothing to do with medic uh, necessarily it had elements of it, but it wasn't medic. And, but that, that's a whole different thing I can talk about, but, but that champion kind of, um, that building the DNA around what that is and getting everyone in the organization 
focused on that was the singular most important thing that we needed to do uh, in the field and uh, at that time. And then it, it is, you know, a fundamental thing that continues to exist regardless of what you're selling. Um, but, um, but that was why the focus became it because it was a focus on champions and I netted out, boom, that this is the issue. And that's become kind of the way I've uh, focused through. So um, it's the singular most important thing because you can have all the other stuff defined, but if you don't have a champion on it, nothing, nothing else matters. So, so, so is this, are these the reasons why you believe cloud became for you? Um, you know, is, is, is it for this approach? Was it your reputation? What is it that cloud B were trying to acquire when they appointed you? Um, they were, uh, they were looking to, um, go to expand revenue, uh, in a big way and to build out the team in a big way. When I went to the company, we we're about 150 people and about, uh, about 20 million or so in revenue. Um, so, uh, and it was, we sold a bunch of things and now we need to, um, we need to kind of expand it and figure out how to sell more and more consistently and grow our footprint, grow new customers, expand bigger ones, uh, land bigger ones. So it was, uh, and oh, by the way, and I had every plus or minus half the company reporting to me throughout my, uh, throughout my time at Club East. So, um, it was not only just the sales aspect, but customer success. And I built a lot of functions too that weren't there. Um, you know, uh, currently close to 500 people, uh, you know, so, um, we built a lot of things out uh, there, but yeah, it was around, it was around growing revenue and doing it in a repeatable and, uh, predictable fashion, building out the business to scale, take advantage of the market opportunity. Great. So let's just talk about the CXOs, right? So you've got Cedric Petch. CRO MongoDB, Adam Ahrens, ex-CRO Okta, Tom Schmidt, CRO AppD, Luca Lazaron, CRO Sprinkler, the list goes on and on and on. Now, you're all very different personalities. You all come from very different backgrounds. Right. Why do you think so many of you have had the success that you've had? I think that, um, I think that there are a couple things I was trying, I've been giving this one some thought so I think there are a couple of things that, that kind of netted out. One is that you've got a, a, a strong level of intelligence. Um, so you've got broad DNA, some good material, like they're all bringing, you know, a good, a good level of, uh, of intelligence to the business. Um, they're all super competitive, um, either with themselves and or, you know, with others. Uh, but that's definitely, uh, definitely a piece. Uh, I think they're all able to take, all of us are able to take leadership. So, um, meaning, you know, you, you, you may have a responsibility to lead your team, but then there's, you're going to have a board that you're working with or, you know, uh, someone else and a CEO, uh, who you have to work with and you're going to have your peers, right? So it's probably leadership as well as feedback. And I don't work with those guys on the, on the side by side, but I think to be in, to be in res responsible and have that type of success, you have to be able to work as a functioning executive with your peers and that take, that means taking feedback and giving it. And creating a good operating environment. Um, there's obviously a huge level of commitment to that mission and establishing that mission. Um, and uh, I think another piece too, and some are probably more creative than others. Uh, and some of those, some companies it's define and go. And some companies it's define, go, reiterate, define again, go, define, go. So, um, but I think there's probably some good creativity. And I think they all um, know how to learn. And that's related to the intelligence and the ability to take leadership. But you have to, you have to learn different technology. You have to learn, um, you have to learn uh, the way that you're going to communicate uh, to the environment, to the people, and be environment aware. And I think they all have, you know, there's some givens in there too around having a framework and then being able to teach, right, and build, uh, build people, um, build, build that cadence. Uh, you know, they might we might have different motivations on why we enjoy that. Or why we do that, but um, but at the end of the day, you can you have to be able able to establish good cadence and good leadership among your uh, among your leaders. So we've obviously spoken to quite a few of the various kind of leaders as part of this kind of podcast series that we're developing. And one other thing that really strikes me is that pretty much every single one has the ability to continue to re to re 
um, to kind of grow and to really re reinvent themselves. Right. Do you put it down to those raw kind of materials that you obviously spoke about, the intelligence, the character, the competitive nature, being able to be taught and be able to be coachable? Do you think those are the ingredients which have enabled these people to keep climbing um, and develop and, and obviously become leaders in their own right? Right. I think so. You know, I think, uh, I think that you, uh, you, it, there's another element too I didn't mention, but it's related to committed, but maybe a little more specific, but it's mission focused. You know, you you identify what the mission is and what the environment is and, and what you need to do to adjust and change and create new to get there, you know, and, um, and with a strong commitment to that, but that mission changes over time within companies and it changes from company to company and it changes from market to market. So I think, um, you know, you need to, you need to be able to take what you've, uh, what you've learned and your framework, but then be able to apply that to the new mission and the new company. And the people are going to be different. The environment's going to be different. The market's going to be different. The customers are going to be different. The sales cycles are going to be, a, be different. And there are certain things that just translate over, but, um, you have to be able to to create a new mission each time, you know? And uh, so I think that's probably one of the things that's that's definitely there is having that mission orientation. You know, I think where you can, where people can fall into a trap is trying to recreate the past or get the band back together or, hey, yeah. we did it here this way, so we have to do it the exact same. No, you, you, need, you need to you may have the same fundamental principles of champions a champion. You've got exit criteria, your sales process, but the activity in your sales process, the activity in your exit criteria, the way you build champions is very different. And depending on who you're, how you're engaging. So you need to be able to adjust that framework to the mission. Yeah. So, so do, you, do you think, obviously you all use different kind of playbooks. Some are probably more pro medic than others. You, you're a little bit more flexible in your approach. But do you think the appreciation of a structure is fundamental to be able to scale to be able to scale in a way that you guys scale your businesses? Yeah, you have to. Um, there's no way because you you know you have to have a you have to have a defined way of 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 helping people to get to be productive, right? When you think you think about ramping if a new person comes in the business and I don't think about ramping just for a salesperson, I think about ramping for pre-sales. I think about it for a solutions architecture. I think about it for post sales, for support, for a renewals person, for BDR, for even in marketing functions, right? A new marketing director or uh, someone who's uh, responsible for digital marketing or owning the content. A ramp is so important. And the only way to establish a really strong ramp when people are new is you have to define exactly what it is you need to learn and you have to define a really good environment for them to learn and you need to define, define a way for them to practice that and have be in a safe learning environment because when a person comes to a company you need to unlearn and then relearn and that's something that's that's not a bmc or blade logic thing or splunk thing that's that's something i created but ramping is so important in order to do that because you have to define what it is that you need to learn and um and then when people, you know, if you get people onto a fast ramp, then they're going to be productive and off and running, and then they can help other people be productive. If they're on a really slow ramp, the longer it goes, the higher the risk is going to be that they're not going to be successful in the business. And the longer that happens, then, uh, then the worse off it gets to be for everyone, because they're, if they're not excited and happy, then they're selling, they're bringing that home. If they're not excited and happy, then they're affecting other people on the team, and they're not fulfilling the goals that they might want to have uh, as a person, right? So it's so important to get people to ramp. And in order to get them to ramp, you have to define the structure, what success looks like when you're productive and everything you need to learn in order to get there. And oh, by the way, the habits, you don't just start out and say, go close business. Okay, let's practice what you need to, um, let's practice how we're going to communicate with the customer. What are the pains that they have? Or what is the what are the things that they're trying to drive, the value drivers they have as a company? And what are the things that are holding them back and where and how does our technology provide some uniqueness in there? And so, um, you know, if you don't have that structure, then there's no, you're just, you're just ex gambling, right? You're going to take a bet every time you, um, you hire someone and, and as a, you can't run an organization that way. It's too unpredictable. You spend too much money and you, and you, it's, there's no way to create a good culture around that. Good culture is what 
what propels you to really strong growth rates. Um, so, do you it. think? Uh, th do you think that the playbook itself, and this is quite an interesting part, because obviously the topic of this, you know, the, the topic of this podcast and the series is all related to, you know, originally was, was Blade Logic, obviously PTC, you know, after having a number of conversations, PTC came to, um, sure. to mind. Um, where do you think, the, do you think the playbook was, you know, came about at that point of PTC? Do you think that John McMahon had an influence of really kind of looking at the software industry and creating a playbook, which has then gone on to influence other people in creating playbooks, whether it be the same, whether it be a variation? Do you yeah. think? Well, you know, I can't speak to the PTC, uh, mm. although I've hired, you know, folks who have been at PTC and, you know, there's some, some similar lineage there and a lot of things translate very well. Um, yeah, I think that John uh, John's had a, a huge impact um, in uh, enterprise sales, no question. Uh, and then I think the people who have been part of that have been created different versions of that, and then had another impact, you know. Um, and then they created an, a different type of leader uh, on a, a morphed version of it, you know. Um, but there was there's definitely uh, no question around. Um, how that impact is driven, uh, the concept of, of playbooks and the, the maybe, I don't know if I'll say particularness, but the, um, the kind of binary approach on, um, on driving a sales cycle, you know, meaning, you know, it's yes or no. If you have, you, you've exited the stage or you haven't, you've agreed on POC criteria or you haven't. So I think, uh, I think that's in that kind of, concept of binariness is something that's inherent in a lot of those playbooks and I think is uh, is is what enables you to identify um, and run a really good cycle the big thing right in running and this is not necessarily taught but this is the big thing in running in running the sales team what you're focused on continuously is reducing your risk right that's what you're that's the whole that's what forecasting is about but that's what your work is you're trying to eliminate all the issues and trying to play where you can win and then play to your strengths and put yourself in a position where the outside variables are just diminished or reduced and that's the whole focus that you have is eliminating risk and the risk is not from running a cycle um, for you as an individual at, at a company or for the company the risk is in reducing the risk for the customer to achieve what they're trying to they're committed to right and that's an important thing i think to, uh, to the linear, and this is kind of me and not me speaking, but you know, if, a, if you can work with a customer so that the customer's timelines and their approach are lined up with what they're trying to do to get them promoted in the context of their business, and there's a problem that's worth solving, it's the most important problem, our job as a, as a team is helping them to be successful in getting that in and helping them to be successful in adopting that and helping them be successful in expanding it, right? Because then people get promoted just only good things happen, right? Um, with, uh, with your technology, but the playbook, if you define what good looks like, you can also, for me, I like to, I'm expanding this. It wasn't necessarily something we did at Blade Logic or BMC, but the way I think about it is I deconstruct what bad looks like and then reverse engineer that into good as well as defining what good is, right? So they're kind of two different ways, but it's all around the, the whole concept of, you know, what you're referring to as a playbook is, <laughs> is all around defining what to do to reduce the risk and optimize your time, optimize your output, and optimize the impact on the customer side, right? So, so, so John, when you have impact on that for sure. Great. So when you're scaling your business, what are the things that you're really tracking? What are the things that you're focusing on? Yeah, um, when you say scaling, what, what exactly do you mean? Well, so... You're obviously, uh, you've been brought into CloudBees, for example. They're obviously looking to grow. They're obviously looking to, um, to, to expand. Uh, there's obviously a lot of things that are going on. There's lots of moving parts. And I imagine that you would try and focus on some particular attributes, whether it would be kind of the growth itself, whether it would be recruitment, whether it would be revenue, whether it would be, you know, looking at specific variables. What are the things that you focus most of your attention to? Yeah, I think in uh, in scaling. So I think about three different sets of processes. Okay, you've got the lead to where someone says, "Hey, I'm slightly interested 
or just put me on your list through I'm mildly interested in becoming an MQL, becoming a sales acceptable lead, becoming an opportunity. So that's the first process. The second process would be an opportunity through its closure. So traditionally a, a sales process, right? Whether that's high velocity or it's high touch or whatever, um, or some combination of the two. And then you've got an adoption process, which includes adopting the software and then uh, renewing the software and expanding. So across those three things, there are three different sets of uh, activities that are happening. So in terms of scaling, from my perspective, the first thing is you need to diagnose what's happening good across those environments and where the biggest issues are, and then uh, identify what the issue, where, where you could have some really, really bad hindrances um, so to, to the business. So to give you an example, a very simple example, if you know how to sell the product really well, you can forget about the leads for a second, but you can hire people. Once they have an opportunity, they can close it. Okay, that's great. However, if the adoption process, it takes a long time to adopt and or there's a lot of leakage or there's churn or customers are having issues with maybe the product works, but they don't know how to get it going. You can sell your way through that. But once you get to X million dollars, if you have a certain churn percentage, you have to hire a bunch more people in order to sell your way out of that. But every churn customer creates a situation for you in which you have some baggage and you have some negative sentiment towards you. So you can't outrun that, right? There aren't finite numbers of customers and finite numbers of, of transactions, whether enterprise or high velocity you can do. So that diagnosing what that churn issue is, and, and or maybe and it might not even be so much of an issue on the product side, it might be, um, it might be establishing best practices and engaging it, you know, day two, day three, day four, here's the, here's what the, Here's where the customer should be at this point in their journey and establishing that. And then maybe it's, it's that. Maybe it's identifying that you need to get the right executive sponsorship and have a call at once every, every week or twice a week for the first three weeks until you get it off the hard part, right? But the point for me in scaling is you have to identify where the structurally sound components are and the structurally weak components are because you can't build on a weak structure. And oh, by the way, even on the lead side, if you can create new opportunities you know, um, by cold calling and some more traditional methods, that's fine, but you're going to outgrow that um, at some point because if you're not, I shouldn't even, maybe not outgrow it, so to speak, but you're going to wind up spending a lot more time and money and lose efficiency on that if you don't establish a really strong lead through qualified opportunity engine. And oh, by the way, you're going to get so many unsubscribes from people cold calling, you're going to, you're going to wind up getting in a bad spot there too. So you have to diagnose um, and de well, I use the words diagnose and deconstruct what's, what's going well and what's not going, what's, what's not going well. And then, uh, my thought about it becomes you identify the patterns of what's happening, right? When you define your ideal customer profile, you can define what, um, what is happening in the environment. So you, and why, why it's really painful and why there are negative consequences on it. And you can define what your differentiators are because that's what you have to ramp with, right? If you hire people and just say, hey, here's the product, you're going to go out and communicate it in seven different ways. Back to my other point, they're going to have a lot of failure and your ramp is not going to be successful. So, and I'm answering your question, Simon, not from just, if, if, you've got, if you've got the business and say, here's the playbook, here's everything, here's our messaging, here's our story, it's good, go run it. That's a different scaling conversation. I'm talking about the one where you need to identify how you're going to scale before you can put the model in place to go scale, right? So, because right. you go put the model in place to go scale, and if you've got it stronger, then you've got a recruiting profile, you've got a way you recruit for the people, you've got enablement defined really well, you've got a ramping period, and you're, you're constantly just teaching your leaders on, um, you know, a ratio of however many six field leaders, and you're identifying where you're building your regions and what you're going to do out that, and you've got your weekly metrics, and, you know, um, and I think about, you're, you're just working on your operating cadence um, and how you're communicating with your people. And I've developed some specific things around that. Um, but, uh, but I think the first thing for me in terms of scaling is you have to I, look at those three different sets of processes and then identify, deconstruct, more importantly, what's not working and, and also identify the patterns of, of success, right? And there's a lot of metrics you can get out of there. But when, how long, when you land a customer, what is the upsell? When does that upsell take place? And when does it take place in a good way? And when does it take place over a year? Or when does it turn? Right? Those are really structurally 
um, critical things to identify because otherwise you put a lot of money into the system and you're going to either have a bad ramp or low and or low productivity and potentially low churn or and or your CAC is super high. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, a lot of deconstruction that needs to happen early on in order to define it. So hopefully, I don't know if I took yeah. that question no, where you were yeah. going, but. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely great. Yeah. What, what, one of the attributes that we've kind of noticed is that a lot of these companies, they do have a very strong, a very powerful kind of recruitment engine to enable you to be able to respond to those needs because it's and good being able to identify, have these gaps. But actually, if you're not able to respond fast enough to those gaps, that can be quite detrimental. Is that, is that part of the reason why these organizations do have such, you know, in, in, I've heard the phrase, do whatever it takes to get the right people. Is that really the mindset across the, that you think? I think the, you know, uh, one of the things that McMahon, I think, would, would talk about, and then, you know, us as leaders would talk about, or, or still would talk about, is the cost of a bad hire, you know? So um, it's, it's super important to, and these are things, you know, you asked earlier about fundamental and frameworks and things that you learn there. It's super important to always be recruiting and it's super important to not sacrifice on recruiting. Um, so, um, and you, you know, you, you sometimes uh, it, takes, it takes a long time to find the right candidate. Sometimes you first call, you find someone who's really good and sometimes people refer, but, um, Find having a continuous recruiting engine and focusing always on that engine and always recruiting and always expecting that you're going to have to promote people, always expecting that people may exit either for your choice or theirs, and you're always going to have that backfill is super, super important. Um, so, and that's because you can't scale. I mean, if you think about scaling revenue, um, you know, okay, can you improve productivity, raise quotas? Sure, that happens naturally over time, but. And can you have your channel do more? Yes, but your channel is going to do more by you working with them and they're not going to do it on their own. Um, and so then, and can you do it in high velocity? That's where you're building, but most of the, you know, high touch and big deals where you're really scaling are coming from touch business. So you have to be able to hire new people, right? And, um, and you, have, you can't sacrifice on that. And, and uh, I think that's so, so important. And, you know, you learn that from um, making good hires, but, you know, you learn it from making bad hires and bad hires are not bad people are just, you know, not the right, the right fit for the role, uh, whatever it might be. And, and uh, so that is so, so important though, you know, cause you, those, those hires you make are going to be the people who are, uh, you know, doing two, three, four, 500% of number. And they're going to be your future leadership team. I mean, over half of my leadership team, at, at Splunk and at Cloudbees are people I, uh, I promoted. And most of them I promote multiple times, you know, um, and they continue to grow more. So you have to, you hire great DNA and, and you have um, pretty amazing things that can happen, but you can't sacrifice on that. With regards to those attributes, we identified in, in kind of the CXOs, that whole kind of being intelligent, having that kind of competitive nature. Is that what you now try and, and recruit for? Is that what you really kind of emphasize? Is, is your recruitment process specific in identifying these types of individuals? Yeah, yeah, and I'll give you some, some color. And when I'm thinking about uh, hiring uh, people, um, there are three characteristics, and then I can give you some qualities too, if helpful, and what I look for in sales, uh, in, in leaders, field leaders too, um, not just sales, but any type of field, marketing, support, success, et cetera. Um, but first one is raw DNA. You've heard me mention this. You can't teach uh, smarts. And the reason that the raw DNA is so important um, is that in order to be effective in communicating with customers, you need to be empathetic. And in order to be empathetic, you need to be able to understand what their environment is like. You need to be able to understand their life and their job. And then you need to be able to understand the technology that you're offering, the service that you're offering, and how those two things meet and how the technology can affect their job. And the only way that people are going to have credit, you're going to have credibility and they're going to listen to you and you, they'll let you into what they're doing and you'll have an opportunity to build a champion is if you have that empathy for their environment. And that's just the function of raw intelligence, be able to compute and understand, um, understand what their environment is and learn that and have empathy for that and also understand the technology and the applicability. The second thing is the ability to unlearn and relearn. You heard me mention this earlier. But the unlearn and relearn means that 
You have to under you have to unlearn your nomenclature, maybe the ROI variables. You have to unlearn the way that you're communicating with audiences. And an example could be a person who may join from a company from uh, from HP, and they're joining a new operations management company, and they've been at HP for a long time. They may be selling to the same person, and maybe reduction in cost and remediation time, and they're selling something similar. But you can't use the HP nomenclature. You need to unlearn that. They need to relearn the new company nomenclature. And uh, the 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 faster you do that, the better you'll be able to to ramp. And you if you refuse to do that, best case scenario, your ramp gets delayed. In my experience, if you refuse to unlearn and still use your same thing, what will happen is you'll probably not be successful and you know exit the company at some point. Uh, and then the third one for me when hiring people is really just their approach and attitude and the skills that they bring. It's a very large umbrella, but when I the big thing I'm looking for there is collaborativeness. Uh, are they able to work with a team? Not because we're so consensus driven, but because in terms of strategy with customers, we spend a lot of time on that and define that. And that, uh, that is part of the business. It's not because um, people can't define their own ideas, but it's because when you put in a lot of experience and skill and different perspectives, you come up with some really strong strategies. So you have to have an attitude that brings that together. So when I look for individual contributors, regardless of the role, those are the three main things. And then I can see a lot from, from their experience and where they've learned different things and what their success rates have been. But I'm, I'm less concerned about necessarily where, what their skills are because you can't see their skills. Their skills are only, their skills are assumed based on their results, right? So it's hard to, you get some of that, but it's hard to get all of that. So I, I look for those major qualities. And then from a leadership perspective, there are some other, um, some other things too, but. And I'll pause for a second, Simon and Alan, and see if you want to go into that or take a different one. Well, I think you should, yeah, continue. It'd be really good okay. to understand how you kind of differentiate the, cool. the, the attributes that you're looking for in, yeah. in leadership. Great. So those three things, right? Plus, um, you have to have uh, pride and humility. So this is kind of something that is a really big thing for me culturally, but it's also something that a leader needs to embody. And what I say, and a balance of the two. So pride means that you're committed to the outcome. If you're going out and it's a startup company, you know, you're mindful of cash. You're not going to order a hundred dollar bottle of wine because maybe you can, but you're not because you know that, you know, you're going to save saving $60. If everybody does that, that's another engineer we can hire, right. To make the product that much better. Another person in marketing or another salesperson, whatever. Um, because you have to have that pride in the company, not just in yourself, and you're putting the company's goals first. But you also have also and pride in everything that you do and the way you show up in every single interaction, because you're defining the brand of the company in every single interaction. But you also have to have a high degree of humility, and sometimes those things are at odds. But humility in that there's no way you can grow unless you're open to feedback, right? And you're open to different perspectives. So you can't be so prideful that you won't listen. Um, you have to be prideful in what you're doing and taking pride in the opportunity to have humility uh, to be able to grow and adjust and learn. And leaders need to be able to embody that for their people um, so that then their people can see it and emulate it. Um, you need to have uh, an ability to create culture and, and, and a touch with your people. Um, and again, I, my expectations are leading from a position of credibility and respect. In order to establish, you're not leading from a position of authority. You may have authority, but that's not how you lead. And if you notice, I don't use the word manager. I always use the word leader because there's a very distinct difference. Leaders lead from credibility and respect. Managers are, you know, authority based and following somebody else's playbook, right? And that's, you know, you have to be able to follow, but you're leading from credibility and respect. That's individual, that's specific, that's created, that's earned. And when you can create that, then you can have a good touch and pulse on your people and you can create the culture. And the culture, as I mentioned, is a culture of ownership, but in every team, you're gonna have a little subset of that, a little difference, but they need to, everybody needs to be able to follow their leader and the leaders need to establish multiple layers of leadership and they're part of formations. Um, we can talk about that too if you want to, but they're part of formations in the business um, and the formations are all nested. Uh, I think the other thing too is foresight. You need to be able to have experience and be able to see everything that's happening within your business. And you, know, you look at your metrics and you look at your numbers, but you're looking a quarter, two, three quarters ahead. You're looking at the market. You're looking at what customers are saying. And that foresight um, helps you to create vision for your people 
and set goals for what they need to do, but it also helps you to create um, uh, awareness in the business that you can communicate on, and up the chain or across the chain so that the business can hear and see what you're seeing, right? You need to be able to, to have that foresight and, and be able to communicate that. I think there's, there's, a, there's a piece, I don't know the right set of words for it, but it, I'll classify it as having a really good balance. And what I mean by that is you've got, uh, you're, you have to be, you're standing between your people's goals and you're standing and their feelings and the company expectations and the reality of the business. And you need to be able to translate that, right? Um, and do that. And that, that requires some balance. And the, 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 the higher up you go in leadership, that balance shifts, but you still need to have it, right? Um, so, because uh, you, if you're focused exclusively on company goals and you're completely uh, touch with your people, then you have huge attrition, right? And if you're completely in touch with your people, then you may make and doing only things that that might be naturally what they want. Then maybe your spend goes too crazy, right? And the company's not in a healthy position. So, as a leader, you need to be able to have that balance. That's a hard one to learn, especially for uh, for people who have come up from you know, individual contributor up through the ranks, but it's a super, super important lesson. Um, and I think the last one, man, is you need to know how to have some fun and have a good time. <laughs> um, because people are going to have fun. They're going to be at their best. And this is a really important thing for me as leader. People are going to be at their best when they can operate with their own natural energy. And when you, you're operating with your own natural energy, you might have pressure, but you can, you can enjoy it. You know, you're working on it together. You're in the same boat. Um, some people have a great sense of humor and can are really great at, at, at jokes and kind of just creating good levity. Other people just, you know, you create an environment for other people to be that, right? But, uh, but your people, you know, you need, no matter what happens, you need, to be, you need to be in a situation where you're building, feeling that you're building something special and feeling that, you know, you're enjoying working with the people that you, you're with and, you know, they're, they're, they're part of your formation. You're enjoying it. You're having fun. You know, you, you need to you need be able to create that. And that's, a, that's a, sometimes a hard one, especially when there's a lot of pressure. But again, it comes back to um, credibility and respect because then you're, you know, when you, when you really establish that well as a leader, then your people will know what's important for the team and they'll help you with that. You know, they'll step into some of that. And uh, so, but it's, it's important to be able yeah. to create a good environment. So I think, I think that leads quite nicely on, and we were talking about this last time we spoke. You know, it's the person behind the CRO. You know, the the job is very, very high demand, right? Um, and you have an innate way of being able to switch off and being able to separate work from personal life, which there's lots of people I speak to, not necessarily at your level, but at management level, that don't switch off. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you're able to do that and, and, and why you've been able to do that. Yeah. And, and you know, for me, it's, um, it's, uh, I, I carry two phones, right? So I got them. <laughs> so, uh, and I have my personal phone, which, oh, my team has my personal number and I usually use that, especially for texting, but I can't, I don't stay on email, you know, continuously over the weekend. But for me, it's kind of a combination of a couple things. One, um, if I I can physically be somewhere, but if I'm not mentally and emotionally there, I might as well not even be there. And that's not fair to anyone I'm with. So I need to have a little bit of a separation myself, because um, otherwise it would it would make it would it would be very tough to have a good family life, you know, for me. Um, so that's one. Uh, just knowing that I need that that kind of I'm in the, I'm in a different mode, you know, uh, and being aware of that too. Um, you know, it's kind of an approach, right? You work really hard so that you can have a good family life. You don't, you know, you don't, uh, work so you can work during your family life. You, you have to have some balance there because otherwise, why are you working so hard? You know, I mean, you, you, and it's not a, it's not a matter of I work this amount of hours and I'm out, right? That's not the point. The, and cause that's not how I think at all. Um, but you, you have to have that balance so that you can enjoy both aspects of your life. But the other thing too, I think that's super important is that, and this is, this is true 
of everyone, although some people may not fully kind of be aware of it. You, you have to recharge. You have to recharge. If you just go continuously and you're never off, then, um, then you're, you get diminishing marginal returns really quickly. You get a higher level of irritability. Your decision-making isn't as strong. You're not in touch. Um, and, uh, and you can be, you know, it's, it, you can't run that, that long forever. So it's a matter of, you know, for me, it's a matter of what's the, what's the right thing for my family, um, having good perspective on life, and uh, and also being aware of where and how I'm going to be the best leader, you know, um, it would I'd be doing a disservice to myself and to, excuse me, to the team if I had no balance, you know. And you also have to have, you have to create, you have to emulate that a bit for your people too, um, so that they know that you have balance, right, and that you you're replacing your family or, you know, you you have you have a value for your personal life outside of it. Um, if you don't, cause if you don't create that as an individual, then no one else will. Right. But as a leader, as a leader, my expectations are, are, uh, are to do that. You know, I was at companies early on and not, not play logic or BMC or, or Splunk, but even before where like, you know, there was a bit of a badge of honor if you're working on your vacation. I'm like, <laughs> so dumb. What are you gonna check on the, like, you know, and maybe, maybe depending on your role, you might have things you need to focus on, but that's not. Like you want to minimize that. And if you're doing that, you want to be quiet about it because you don't want to set the expectation for other people to do that. And, you know, you, you may do that depending on your role, especially as, you know, as an executive, but um, like that is not something you want your individual people to think that's good. Right. Then their, their, their spouse or significant others, like, you know, you work all week and then you come and you're still like, what are you doing, dude? Yeah. You, you know, and then they have a situation at home and their family life isn't as good. And then, it carries over into work. It's just not fair. It's not good. You know, now I think the thing that's important though, when we talk about the balance is not that you're, you're shutting off, you know, you work eight hours and eight Oh one, you're like out for me. Some days, you know, uh, I'll be in the office from eight in the morning till one at night. Right. Um, and that might go for two or three days and then, uh, maybe not three days, hopefully, but there are occasions in which that'll happen or I'll work and then come out for a couple hours and then work again. Um, and, but I'm doing it cause it's, you know, what I'm committed to doing, but also if I'm doing that, then, you know, maybe my son or daughter has an event at three o'clock and when I, my kids were little, you know, they're, they're Halloween parades, right. Um, at two o'clock in the afternoon, or there's a, something, uh, something going on at school at midday, like, just go do it. You know, like you, you want to, you don't want to, you don't want to work so much so that you miss all the things that you're working hard in order to be able to do and afford, right? And provide a good life for your family. You want to be able to capitalize on them. So for me, I'm, I've always career, tried to create an environment with people where it's like, hey, you're going to work hard, not because, again, not because I'm asking you to or because the business is asking you to or because your leader's asking you to. You're working hard because of the culture of ownership that you have for what you want to become and where you want to take the company and make that the best and most special place that you can. And I trust you to have you know, to balance your time, right. Um, and to do what you need to do and, and be open about it. Right. Um, Which, but if, if you can't, if you can't establish that kind of trust with your people and yeah. create an environment where people know to do that, then like, I don't think you're being a great leader. Yeah. Really? Like that's just, that's just hiding yeah. behind some management. Yeah. I think the great, the, yeah, the, the ability for, creating transparency over what success looks like is the important part right if you go back to the very you know first part of this podcast we're talking about you know, clear guidelines of what success looks like yeah, an individual sure. can take accountability of what that success needs to be and they know how much time they need to input to to to, to create that and right. i think that transparency stems right from the very beginning um so if you've got that transparency over what they need to do then they can create that work-life balance. They don't have to be in there, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, um, yeah. If you think time is the answer, it's not necessarily the answer. Efficiency is the answer. Efficiency right? and working smart. Especially the more experience you get, you don't have as much time to make mm. decisions, right? You can't look at, at, at you know, and study data for three days. You have to <laughs> fall on it quickly, you know, so... Um, yeah, you need to be efficient. You just the more the more ex responsibility you have, the more decisions you have to make. So your your days may get a little bit longer, but uh, but that's okay. But that's just because it's a, a part of the job, you know. So 
obviously anybody listening into this, you know, there's going to be a high number of aspiring salespeople. You know, what advice could you give those individuals that are looking to break that glass ceiling? Is there any three parting tips that, you know, you could share? Three uh, parting tips. Yeah. Um, I would say, um, number one is define and get a really good understanding of what good looks like and what you need to do in order to be successful, no matter what the job is, like, what is the pattern that you need to emulate? Um, you know, uh, number two, commit to being, um, a, uh, really developing a level of mastery and expertise in that. And then, uh, I might have four. Number three, um, look to always continue to learn right and number four like be empathetic with your environment with your customer with your prospective uh, person so you you understand what they're going through what their life is and, and uh and what their what their business is and, and back to my early points on dna and ability to understand your job right what what is and how can you align and affect that and you have to be the other i guess maybe the other piece is you have to be genuine and authentic you know you're not they're not, they're not, people are, customers are, you know, they, they become successful when you help, when we, the technology does great things for them, but you're helping them to be the best version of themselves too. So, um, you know, you're there to, uh, to, you have to be really sincere about that. And, and, uh, and when you are super sincere about that, then, then you can talk through anything, you know, there have been a lot of customers that I've worked with over the years and been exec sponsor on where, you know, we may butt heads a little bit, but we're not butting heads for any reason other than like, it's just getting to, to a good place, you know? So I think, um, when you're super empathetic and super in touch, then, then you can have really good conversations with your audience and that leads you to be able to have great impact and develop great dialogue and relationship and, and drive great, help them to help your customers to drive great things for in their business. So. Wonderful. Well, Anthony, we have to say it's been a real pleasure um it's been yeah. fantastic having you on the show if we were to kind of summarize it seems as though you know when you entered the world of sales you're obviously very entrepreneurial you obviously had that natural kind of sales ability that kind of raw material that dna that we're obviously talking about um you know you were obviously someone that could continue to reinvent themselves uh obviously Destiny perhaps brought you to, to kind of BMC and, and, uh, and Blade Logic, which kind of gave you maybe some more structure, which yeah. was really important for you to be able to adopt that and really understand the importance of these strategies, um, which then obviously allowed you to become the best version of yourself, which is how you were then able to continue to push and grow and develop, break the glass ceiling and end up where you have today. So again, I just want to say, you know, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. We've really enjoyed having you. And um, yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for, for taking part. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Thanks to both of you guys. It's been a lot of fun. Really appreciate it.